Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the World Citizen Virtual Book Club. Today is Saturday, May 18th. I'm sorry, it's May 14th. I was living in the future for a moment. May 14th, and I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions. Uh, I'm joined uh, actually by our entire staff, as well as the uh, our book club coordinator, Gail Hughes, um, Drea Bergman, who's got the Canadian flag up. Um, she is our director of programs and campaigns. Uh, that department produces this event. And Byron Velitsos is our di uh, director of marketing and development. So uh, this is our fifth of six sessions, Reading the Politics of World Federation by Joseph Barada. And we've been indeed fortunate to have Joseph with us uh, for this entire exploration. And he is uh, with us today as well. We'll be focusing on chapters 20 and 22, uh, which themselves focus on Henry Wallace uh, and world federalism in the States. Um, we'll proceed as usual with Joseph pointing out what he feels are the highlights and main takeaways uh, from those chapters. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, I ask everybody to go on mute at this time and, and go back to mute when you're not speaking. Um, you're welcome to use the chat feature in Zoom to communicate with each other, uh, but we, we won't be monitoring it um, during, the, during the session. Um, we'll stop at about 10 minutes before the end of the session for any announcements um, about any you know, relevant events, uh, book releases, films, whatever. Uh, so if you have an announcement, please hold it till that time. Um, we also ask occasionally people forget this and send out emails to the group about events and things of that sort. Uh, we ask that you do not do that. Um, people have not given their permission to have their email used in that way. And we uh, then get complaints that we are filling up people's email uh, boxes and all that stuff. So if you want to make an announcement, by all means, do it here. You could put a link. Um, in the chat if you want to, an event announcement or anything of that sort. Um, we'll ask latecomers to identify themselves to um, prevent Zoom bombing. And uh, if someone comes on that we uh, don't know their name or whatever, we may stop and ask them to identify themselves. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Joseph. Well, greetings, everybody. Uh, several questions at our last meeting are still unresolved. Ron Glossop and others asked about Mikhail Gorbachev. Did Gorbachev win the Nobel Prize? How much money did Ted Turner of CNN give for the Gorbachev Foundation? Answers, yes, uh, Gorbachev won the Peace Prize on, in October 1990 but he did not dare to travel to Oslo in order to receive it until June, 1991. His prize lecture was on perestroika and new thinking. The attempted coup start, uh, followed in August and the USSR was dissolved on 25 December, 1991. Uh, Ted Turner, did give him on Raisa's recommendation $1 million for the Gorbachev Foundation. It was built on Leningradsky Prospect in 2001 after Raisa's death. A Gorbachev, in his book of 2017, The New Russia, discusses Ukraine abundantly and he tends to agree with Vladimir Putin about NATO's threat to Russia. He sees little difference between Ukrainians and Russians. His own wife, Raisa Maximimova, uh, was Ukrainian. Oh. <laughs> and so was his maternal grandmother. His father fought in the Great Patriotic War in battlefields through Ukraine, like Kharkov and Kiev. Crimea, Gorbachev argues, was properly returned to Russia since the plebiscite was fair. The current war he does not anticipate. Simon Simonian asked a question about UN effectiveness, which implies the rule of law. 
Several times I have mentioned norms which scholars find at work in international relations as if they were world laws. They are strictly international laws. Norm comes from the Latin norma, rule. Norms are shared expectations, unwritten customary standards of state conduct, not acts of any legislature, though norms function as if they were world laws. They're not enforceable in any court like municipal laws. Norms are customs, one of the components of international law like treaties. They are what Jefferson called the law of nations. Here is a complete list. Sovereignty, which implies territorial integrity and non-interference in domestic jurisdiction. It is no longer absolute despite what you hear. It is enshrined in the UN Charter Article 2.1. Non-aggression in Article 2.4. Peaceful settlement, Article 2.3. And uh, uh, treaties must be observed in the old Latin pacta sunt seranda in Articles 2, 2, 4, 1, 6, 25, 43, 49, and 56. Um, also the right of self-defense in Article 51. Collective security in Chapter 7 uh, after Article 39. And uh, lastly, freedom of the seas, gross, uh, going back to Hugo Grotius. Other norms are covered by various conventions, treaties, resolutions, customs, which are not universal and are easily reversible, though they are generally observed. For example, the rights of women, as in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, a treaty to which the US is not a party. They provide one solution to the problem of enforcement since states are obliged to enforce treaties under national law, as in the US Constitution Article 6. I'd like to read uh, some of these other norms. It's good to know uh, them and um, I'll make one final comment. Um, other norms include diplomatic immunity, recognition of states, rights of small states, right to participate in international organizations, sanctity of borders, non-aggression, reciprocity, expectation of retaliation, humanitarian intervention to prevent genocide, the responsibility to protect, uh, human rights of individuals, enforcement of human rights by national law, self-determination of peoples, decolonization, secession from states or UN is not provided for, common security, human security, preservation of the environment, sustainable development, human rights as common values, women's rights, the education of girls, non-militarization of Antarctica, non-militarization of space, global capitalism and liberal democracy. Now, David Gallup has challenged me about the source of that World Federalist shorthand quotation. There can be no peace without justice, no justice without law, no law without government. This is an amalgam of Grenville Clark at Dublin and United World Federalist under Clark's influence in its first statement of beliefs and purposes. 
quote, it is almost axiomatic that there can be no peace without order and no order without law at Grenville Clark Declaration of Dublin. We believe that peace is not merely the absence of war, but the presence of justice, of law, of order, in short of government and the institutions of government. United World Federalist Statement of Beliefs. Many other sources connect peace, justice, law, and government. Uh, Barach, Barach, Virginia Swain and others asked about pacifism. Albert Einstein, who had been, in, been with Romain Roland, a principled pacifist until the rise of Nazi Germany, fled the country when Hitler came to power in 1933. He felt obliged to change his public attitude toward war and declared that if he were a Belgian, he would not refuse military service for Germany was preparing a war of revenge. Einstein summed up his views starkly in 1941 in response to a lad in Missouri facing prison because of his refusal to bear arms. Einstein explained, quote, there are two kinds of pacifism, sound and unsound. Sound pacifism tries to prevent wars through a world order based on power, not through a purely passive attitude toward international problems. Unsound, irresponsible pacifism contributed in large measures to the defeat of France in 1940, as well as to the difficult situation in which England finds herself today. I urge you to do your share lest this country make the same mistake. I am a sound pacifist. I believe that the Quaker peace testimony needs updating in the 20th and 21st centuries. I am a convinced world federalist. I believe that world guardians and international police force will have to be organized under a world republic to provide emergency security for states if they accept general and complete disarmament under effective international control, as stated in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That would make possible the rule of world law. I also believe in defending America during the transition, as in my own military service. When the United States merely projects power, as in wars in the Middle East, it exceeds the right of self-defense. We, the citizens, rightly protest. We continue to serve our country. And Gail Hughes asked about Mary Meyer. Mary and Cord Meyer were a prominent couple, 1945 to 57. She bore him three sons, one, Michael, was killed in an auto accident near their home in Washington. The marriage did not survive and they were divorced in 1957, well before the election of John F. Kennedy. She then was unmarried and practiced painting. There is no evidence that she may have had an affair with President Kennedy. Seymour Martin Lipset does not mention her among other women who claim to have had such affairs. She was killed mysteriously while jogging along the CNO towpath in 1964. The police found a suspect who was quickly cleared. However, the mystery has led to a massive conspiracy theory by Peter Janney, son of Vistar Janey, a figure comparable to Cordmeyer in the CIA. Peter Janey contends that Mary was deeply committed to world federalism, news to me, <laughs> had an affair with President Kennedy while Jacqueline was burying him, his children, was privy to Kennedy's fears of the CIA because of his determination to wind down the Cold War after the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> after his assassination, 
Janney speculates, Mary could have revealed her knowledge of CIA threats to the president. Hence, she was killed in a typical CIA covert operation to cover up. She kept a diary, but the diary was never found. This star, Janney, was the key go-between with Cord after the murder. There appears no love left for father from son. Later, CIA abuses were fully revealed by Senator Church in 1975, but no relevant document from the CIA has been declassified. This scandal, unproven, is the latest high-level attack on United World Federalists. It purports to be an attack on the CIA during its worst period of abuse of public trust and democratic values, but it sullies any memory of key people in the World Federalist Movement, like Cord Meyer and his first wife. Peter Janney even contacted me shortly after my book was published. I was surprised that he had no interest in Cord Meyer, but only wanted to know anything salacious about Mary. I refused to talk with him. His book does not observe the first rule of serious history, critical use of evidence. We should forget about it. <coughs> now, um, before I turn to uh, comment on first uh, chapter uh, 22, World Federalism in the States, uh, I might just open this up for any comp re response from uh, those of you I've mentioned in these introductory remarks. <coughs> uh, Ron or Gail or... Um, hey, just raise your hand if you um, want to be in the queue. There may not be any questions, but if there are, this is the time. Okay. Oh, it doesn't look like... Oh, okay, Simon. And you need to go off mute. Uh, Joseph, uh, thank you. Uh, could you elaborate on the Quaker peace testimony update, requiring an update? I agree with you. Um, Virginia, can you quote the peace testimony? It just says um, that basically that un there's no um, no armed response to um, to a war. I mean, it's the, the peace. I'm sorry, I'll have to look for it, but I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. That's probably best. But I um, I'll, I'll speak after when I'm called. Uh, okay. I'd like to uh, quote that exactly. I didn't, um, uh, but it's absolute pacifism and as absolute refusal to cooperate with the, any state uh, uh, or to bear arms uh, in a, a war of the state. So it's what uh, Einstein called unsound pacifism, whereas sound pacifism, it, is one that wishes, is to determined to uh, <clears throat> preserve the peace by the organization of power uh, to deal with international problems rather than ignore them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let's, um, until we uh, get the actual text, I forget how it goes. It's, it's George Fox uh, writes in the, um, 17th century. Great, thank you. So then I'll, br I'll bring uh, Virginia into the conversation. Virginia, you had a question about? That? Oh, I just, um, I, I put the Quake, Quaker Peace testimony in the chat, Joseph. Oh, thank you. Um, but I just have a question too, because uh, Ben Bradley, who is um, sister-in-law to, um, sister, uh, brother-in-law to um, Mary Pinchot, wrote a lot about Mary's life and murder in his book, in his autobiography, A Good Life. He was the Washington Post editor. So it's just another resource to look at this issue if you're interested. I don't know if anyone's interested in this, but it has a lot of implications. Uh, if it's true, there's a lot of implications for 
Kennedy's Kennedy's actions. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions in response to the issues Joseph spoke to before? Okay, seeing none, Joseph, I guess we're okay. on to Henry Wallace. Well, no, um, uh, Bob, I'm going to start with World Federation in the States. Oh, that's right, that's right, thank you. And we'll do Wallace next Great. after that. Um, I would like to start with chapter 22, World Federalism in the States. I thought it would be most useful to you since Citizens for Global Solution also aspires to reach the public on today's global problems. <coughs> Other great political movements like the progressive movement, the movement for women's suffrage and the civil rights movement have similar stories to tell. <coughs> there were three lines of action, the Humber resolution an eloquent but non-binding state resolution recommending national legislation, the Massachusetts version of the Humber resolution and referenda, and the California plan, which exercised article five of the US constitution and hence was a binding resolution to amend the constitution to permit US participation in a world federal government. The maps and tables starting on page 449, I think, should most briefly and vivid and uh, reveal what happened. What is most striking to me is how decentralized the Humber resolutions were. From 1941 to 1950, Robert Lee Humber, a wealthy lawyer with international competence, visited 41 state legislatures trying to raise consciousness and build political will. He won passage of his state resolution in 19. He started in North Carolina and then crisscrossed the country during the war and aftermath. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the text is in a, appendix G, <clears throat> excuse me. Joseph, do you need to go get a glass of water or something? Well, let me see if I can keep going a little bit. Uh, okay, great. Um, the Massachusetts type was distinguished by greater involvement of the voting public by signature campaigns, canvassing of neighborhoods, distribution of pamphlets, and finding debate in the state legislature. Even Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, long before he entered Congress and became speaker opposed to President Reagan, guided the resolution to passage in both Massachusetts House and Senate. Um, the quote, the text is on page 452. Now the California plan was much more as serious. It was carefully crafted by lawyers uh, at United World Federalists, including Alan Cranston and led by Grenville Clark. They built on the modest gains of the Humber and Massachusetts resolutions, but boldly aimed to exercise the provision in Article 5 for amendment of the US Constitution by two thirds of the states, which would have been 32 in 1949. The eloquent text is not before you, it's in Appendix G, but it called for a constitutional convention like that in Philadelphia in 1787 for the sole purpose of proposing amendment of the constitution to expedite and ensure the participation of the United States in a world federal government open to all nations with powers which while defined and limited shall be adequate to preserve peace. The second map and tables on pages 454 to 55 show the stunning result. And if you could, I did ask you to print it out. Take a look at it. Um, the um, uh, 454 and 455 it includes a map as well as a table of the actual states which uh, were involved. Um, the California plan actually passed in six states, Wisconsin, Maine, 
California, New Jersey, Florida, and Connecticut. Uh, yet, as the North Atlantic Treaty progressed in, in the Cold War by 1949, it was introduced and pending in 10 more. Ohio, Minnesota, Utah, Iowa, Michigan, Massachusetts, New York, Washington, Illinois, and Indiana. An even more radical resolution to elect delegates to Henry Usborne's World People's Constitutional Convention actually passed in Tennessee, where it was introduced, and it was introduced in Pennsylvania and Kentucky. Again, the map shows how widespread was public sympathy for such measures which spread from the Northeast to the Midwest, the South, and the West. The result is hard to explain away. World Federation was popular. So if you look at that, the second map, these are much more serious uh, uh, resolutions. The, 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 these were much more serious states which agreed to the California plan or, um, or the six states that agreed to it and then the 10 that were had it before them as the Cold War reached its climax. <coughs> and then um, notice Tennessee. I find this very interesting. Why Tennessee? You know, isn't Tennessee in the South? We don't think of the South as being a hotbed of um, international uh, organization. Um, I wonder if anybody has a guess why, why Tennessee? might have passed a bill to actually elect using state electoral uh, mechanisms, three delegates to a World People's Constitutional Convention in Geneva in 1950. Well, I'll let you uh, worry about that. Um, if you go back to the first map, again, notice that's on page 449. Again, this world, these World Federalist resolutions were not popular just in the Northeast, you know, or in Massachusetts. Uh, they were popular in the South and in the Midwest and in the Far West. I find that very, very instructive, really. It shows you, it shows you, as I say, that World Federation was popular. Um, I'm going to conclude these remarks uh, with a short note about World Federation in the United States. After the uh, efforts in the states, there were actions in the nation. Many people think the 16 World Federalist resolutions in the US Congress mark the climax of the movement. I think it would be useful here to quote the leading World Federalist resolution that actually emerged in Congress, House Concurrent Resolution 64. It is not before you, see Appendix H, but it is widely no known and often quoted. And I'd like to quote this. House Concurrent Resolution 64. It was introduced by Representatives Brooks Hayes, Democrat of Arkansas, and Walter, a Walter Judd, Republican of Minnesota. Uh, Gail, you're in Minnesota, aren't you? Resolved by the House of Representatives, the Senate concurring, that it is the sense of the Congress that it should be a fundamental objective of the foreign policy of the United States to support and strengthen the United Nations and to seek its development into a world federation open to all nations with defined and limited powers adequate to preserve peace and prevent aggression through the enactment, interpretation, and enforcement of world law. HCR 64 eventually drew 111 co-sponsors, including some of these figures uh, you older people should uh, recognize. Mike Mansfield, Democrat of Montana, Jacob Javits, Republican New York, John David Lodge, Republican of Connecticut. He was the grandson of Henry Cabot Lodge who had uh, defeated Wilson's project to, to establish the League of Nations. Also, Abraham Ribikoff, Christian A. Herter, 
who became a Secretary of State under Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, the future president, Gerald Ford, also a future president, uh, Charles Eaton, Peter Rodino, uh, John Voorhees, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., Democrat of New York. There was a similar resolution in the Senate, SCR 56, the identical text as I read, it eventually drew 21 co-sponsors, including Claude Pepper, Democrat of Florida, Hubert Humphrey, Democrat of Minnesota, John Sparkman, Democrat of Alabama, B. Russell Long, Democrat of Louisiana, Lister Hill of Alabama, Paul Douglas of Illinois, and Wayne Morris, Republican of Oregon. Most people find HCR 64 and all the 16 World Federalist Resolutions a stunning achievement. True, they were all sense resolutions, that is concurrent resolutions, unlike the Vandenberg Resolution, which passed and led to NATO. But imagine such bills today. Now to, to turn to chapter 20, Henry Wallace's challenge in the election of 1948. Byron. Yes, I'm here. I think that, yeah. You must be working late. I am. <laughs> I think this campaign is the model for the ultimate effort to influence events and undertake action to achieve not only peace, but also such goals as preserving the environment or coordinating international medical response to new pandemics or reforming the world financial system. This is the order of magnitude for the coming political struggle. Henry Wallace was the last new dealer left in after Roosevelt's death. Wallace had been FDR's secretary of agriculture, then was vice president in the third term and finally secretary of commerce in the Truman administration. The long war had brought new men to power, hardened by mass mobilization of the country against implacable fascist foes like Dean Acheson, James Forrestal, Robert Patterson, and W. Averill Harriman. During the, four, the struggle for the four freedoms during the war, Wallace maintained the view that what was at stake was freedom from want and freedom from fear. He commonly talked in terms of one world, a world new deal, the people century, opposed to Henry Luce's American century, a strong United Nations, emerging world law, and ultimate world citizenship. There was nothing that will save us, he wrote in Toward World Peace, for the 1948 campaign, but belief in the unity of all mankind. These views were uncomfortably close to communist party propaganda of the liberation of the worker and peasant classes from the bourgeois and capitalist classes. In the circumstances of the early Cold War, Wallace was an easy target of anti-communist ideologues. He did have a plank in the Progressive Party platform, looking forward to a universal world federal government, which I quote at length. But the election was not really fought over the issue of world government. It was fought over the whole direction of the Truman administration toward getting tough with the Russians, denying Stalin his security concerns in Eastern Europe, and remobilizing the country for war. There was a press feeding frenzy over the world government plank when the Vermont delegation proposed an amendment to state that the party's criticism of American foreign policy did not imply approval of Soviet policy, which was voted down lest it appease the red baiters. Wallace bravely tried to oppose rising anti-communism as anyone 
would have to do in order to build peace between differing nations and ideologies. Quote, I am not afraid of communism, he said at a speech at Gilmore Stadium in early 1947, shortly after he was fired from the Truman administration. If I fail to cry out that I am anti-communist, it is not because I am friendly to communism, but because at this time of growing intolerance, I refuse to join even the outer circle of that brand, band of men who stir the steaming cauldron of hatred and fear. Unquote. The difficulty of opposing allegedly imperialistic American foreign policy without appearing to fall for Russian propaganda is with us to this day. We cannot criticize NATO expansion toward Ukraine without being accused of falling for Putin's propaganda. We cannot criticize the triumphalism of US policy after breakup of the Soviet Union without being accused of the same thing, Putin's propaganda. We cannot criticize Israel over her treatment of the Palestinians without being accused of anti-Semitism. As things happened in 1948, Clark Clifford, a young legal counselor to President Truman at the start of a long advisory career, prepared a democratic campaign strategy to deliberately exploit public fears of communism. The historian Richard Walton de details just how this political strategy was carried out in the election, primarily by the liberal Americans for Democratic Action. The attitude of world federalists to Wallace is interesting. Members of the Chicago committee were active in Wallace's practical politics. Idaho Senator Glenn Taylor, who introduced two maximalist world federalist bills in Congress, became Wallace's vice presidential running mate. Scott Buchanan, philosopher and dean of St. John's College, where the great books were read, teamed up with Williams College professor Frederick Law Schumann, a teacher of the new doctrine of realism, to draft the world government plank. Former New Dealer and member of the Chicago committee, Rexford Guy Tugwell, chaired the platform committee and was the one who thought the Vermont resolution timorous. Tugwell is interesting for he later drafted a revision of the US Constitution in 1970, as did Thomas K. Finletter, 1945. These were the thinkers who thought the problem of the 40s was not to form a good world government, of the, but to reform the obsolete government of the United States. Cordmeyer of UWF refused to cooperate with Wallace. He said, not because they were communists working in the Progressive Party, but because since there were, the party was sure to lose the election. To be fair to Meyer, he had vivid experience with communist destructive tactics in Charles Bolte, American Veterans Committee. G.A. Borgesa, of the Chicago committee refused to support Wallace since reconciliation between Russia and America was too small a basis for action on the maximal world constitution. Edith Winter refused to support Wallace because of her and Rosika Schwimmer's experience of the Communist Party's flip-flops on Stalin's orders in 1935, 1939, 1941 and 1947. Communism was not a normal political party seeking to change national laws by majority rule in bourgeois legislatures, but an agent of a foreign power committed to destroy democracy. Only Einstein who endorsed Wallace's pre-election book Toward World Peace found his ideas excellent in the present dangerous situation. 
Despite opposition from world government movement leaders, Wallace in important ways was fighting their political battles. I urge you to read the dramatic story of his leadership in the election of 1948. The election was, I think, the climax of the politics of World Federation. It was a rehearsal for coming struggles over global governance. But in the end, Wallace lost his progressive third party challenge to Truman, garnering only one and a half million votes, even fewer votes than racist Strom Thurmond in a fourth party, the Dixiecrats. After the election, Mortimer Adler of the Chicago Committee reflected on their significance for world government. He was most impressed by Truman's victory, which was proof of a sort of what could be accomplished by straight talk to the people. Truman, of course, had not campaigned on foreign policy, but even on domestic policy, his gutsy whistle-stop campaign illustrated an important point about political education. Nothing does more to instruct the people in a democracy about their choices for domestic or foreign policy. Adler argued, than a candidate for office who risks his political neck by taking a stand on the issues. Political education, said the great exponent of liberal education, cannot really be accomplished in classrooms, journal articles, editorials, radio commentaries, or books. It is accomplished in the personal involvement of an appeal to the voters. Woodrow Wilson understood this when he took the League of Nations to the country. Roosevelt again and again between 1932 and 1945 risked his neck to educate the, the electorate, particularly on the New Deal. The lesson to be drawn from these facts is simple, Adler concluded in Common Cause, the journal of the Chicago committee, quote, if the American people are ever to become politically educated about the issues of world government, world government must be made an active political issue in American life. Not until a major political figure in this country is for world government and is willing to stake his political success on that issue, or not until a person who is for world government becomes a major political figure in this country on that very issue, will truly political education on the subject of world government begin for the American electorate. Not until it does can we hope for political action on the part of the United States. And not until we can expect such action can we expect the beginning of actual steps toward the formation of a world republic." Unquote. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I guess that was a long introduction. But I now open it up to any questions that you may have. Great. So before we do that, I just want to uh, remind people to put up their cyber hand. Um, if they have a question or comment, I will then follow those. Once I clear all the cyber hands, if for anyone who doesn't know how to do that, I'll take the hands in the flesh. Um, if you would first, you know, our conversations have been very far reaching and have in the past gone beyond the chapters. So I ask you to first focus on the chapters if you have questions about those, and then we can go off in other directions. Uh, please keep your questions short so we get a chance to bring everybody in. Uh, and with that, I will begin to take questions. If anybody has one, you could raise your cyber hand first. Seeing no cyber hands at the moment, I'll go to Ron. And then Gail. <laughs> I would just like to make a comment. I think it's worth remembering that in this period, I know it's not having to do with legislative and political things, but I think it was very important that the national debate question for high schools was on world government, 1947. That's how I got interested in world federalism. I was a debater. It was a national debate topic. 
So I think that's an indication of how important the idea was at that time in the United States. Oh, that's that's uh, very true, Ron. And uh, one of my delights um, in doing this research was, was discovering those old um, guidebooks for the um, high school debates in the 40s. Yes. Uh, and they were, um, they were filled with the selections from the literature, were well chosen. And um, it's, I mean, uh, young people uh, were uh, key to the formation of the movement. And, um, and uh, Harris Wolford uh, organized a student federalist on uh, Clarence Streit's uh, principles. Um, and that became a key organization in the formation of United World Federalists by 1948, uh, 1947, yeah. Great, um, okay, thank you, Ron. Gail. Um, one thing that struck me was um, it commented about the incentive that countries have to start wars in order to, um, like with Truman, um, um, to get reelected. And I, I'm thinking that's one of the fundamental problems that we have at present that a world federation would possibly solve. Um, I just wanted to make note of that. And um, my question is, it commented that Eleanor Roosevelt opposed Wallace. And he sounded like, you know, just this terrific guy who really admired and followed um, her husband. So why would she oppose him? As you said, he, he seemed to be the last New Dealer. So why would she oppose that? Um, well, that's a good question. And I bet if we looked up um, several of the biographies of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, we'd, we could find that answer. Um, but I suppose that um, the problem was not, not that Wallace was not a sincere New Dealer, but that uh, in the circumstances of 1948, uh, he was, um, he was a, a prominent in uh, taking the, the, the Soviets seriously, even to the point where he tolerated communist uh, operatives were in the progressive party. And this became a notorious and quite true. And Eleanor Roosevelt could hardly support a move, uh, a politician who uh, seems to be a dupe of the communist party of Joseph Stalin. So she herself uh, split from a serious new dealer, the last new dealer uh, in the US government uh, over the issue of um, communism. I think this is uh, something to bear in mind, uh, Bob Flax. Um, as soon as you get a little effective, you're going to be uh, subverted and attacked uh, from, uh, from the right, maybe even from the left. And uh, it's almost impossible to conduct a serious uh, witness um, under these circumstances. It's one reason I actually prefer to write books and articles. I don't try to speak in public platforms about world government. Uh, it, just, uh, it just opens you up to uh, ridicule these days. But, you, but, if, but in, a, in a big book like mine, you know, hey, if you really wanna know something about it, you can read the book. Uh, and there are serious people who do that because it come bring, this is how you can talk about serious issues, including uh, accommodation with the Soviet Union. I think we also need to keep in mind that the leadership in the Soviet Union changes. There's a big change between Gorbachev and Putin. <laughs> Great. So, Joseph, I'll take more 
questions, or unless you're in the middle of a thought? Well, if I, I can just go back to what Gail's first comment about the sure. about the uh, strategy of, of Truman to invite divide uh, to um, deliberately use anti-communism to smear uh, Henry Wallace, um, uh, Clark Clifford is a very famous uh, advisor to presidents, and, uh, and this it's his career started with this. 1948 campaign against Wallace. And this is typical of the dirty politics that uh, helped to destroy the movement. It, it will happen again. Great. Um, yeah. Byron, and then I'll put myself in the queue. You got to go off mute, Byron. I was listening with my eyes closed, uh, but you're right, I was beginning to doze, so thanks for calling me out. Um, you quoted uh, Adler, uh, a, a lengthy quote from it, so I, I take it you approve what he was saying about tactics in, in the sense that uh, any, anyone that's going to be effective has to educate the electorate and go directly to the people in the ways that you cited, that he cited. And so you're, what you're, I guess, saying is Wallace did not do that. Is that the implication? I don't think you directly said that, or he, he didn't directly say that, that Wallace was not really a good campaigner and didn't have good tactics in that sense. Is that what you're getting at? Uh, yes, because uh, Wallace uh, quieted uh, reference to the world government plank in his platform. And um, so the, it, the election was not fought over the issue of world government in 1948. Um, the only politician who openly campaigned as a advocate of world government was Britain's Henry Usborne not to be confused with America's Henry Wallace. And Usborne was a uh, industrialist from Birmingham who um, ran on the labor ticket and won office in 1945 in, in Britain. And, and he won re-election in 1950 on the same platform as an open federalist. So I think the, um, you're right. Um, uh, oh, the only case of a politician who staked his election on uh, the issue of, of uh, uniting the world under law was Henry Osborne. Um, Wallace was outmaneuvered. I, I regard him as a tragic figure. Um, yeah. If you read any of his books and uh, think about his work for agriculture and the Midwest, um, it's, uh, it's sad that he is, he's regarded to this day as a dupe of the Communist Party. And um, I have, I must confess, I, I had, I have hoped uh, since the end of this Communist Party in 1990 and the fall of the USSR, I, I thought that if the, um, the whole project of socialism uh, has been discredited. The P Communist Party has been discredited. So who's got an issue that grips people the way anti-communism grip people? Uh, I'm learning now that there are other ways to, to, uh, to uh, uh, corrupt and, and um, defeat uh, idealistic movements, say like yours. Um, yeah. But if you're, I mean, imagine if you really were effect, had some kind of public presence and became known as uh, an effective advocate for um, economic reform to arrest global warming. Um, Politicians would have to take up that issue and, and run on that 
on that issue. And that's where Adler is correct. Uh, it's not enough to just talk about this in big books or even uh, clever articles yeah. uh, or even uh, in high school debates. Uh, it, it's got to get to uh, that, that crunch of a national election where, where somebody, people are, are really going to uh, risk their political necks by uh, taking a stand on important issues like preservation of the environment. We can say that Adler being a pragmatist called it right. Oh, I, I thought that was a, a stunning statement by Adler. Yeah. Um, I agree. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in next, uh, Joseph, unless you have further thoughts on that. No. no. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a comment and a question. For, first, the comment um, is that, Joseph, yes, we actually, uh, am among the staff, certainly, and to a lesser extent among the board, um, we have talked about on a number of occasions that, you know, once we get bigger and more well known, uh, we will have to deal with the opponents and the saboteurs, if you will, although I don't think we've used that term per se. Um, so it's good to hear your validation that we're not just paranoid uh, and that you actually believe that that is the case. So <laughs> that is, it's good to know. So, so that, that's the comment. The, the question is that in, in our strategic planning and as well as an exercise that we recently went through uh, the theory of change process with CGS is we, we come, we, we've arrived at kind of three major stages in terms of how to promote this. And there's lots of details along the way, but the three major stages is one is public education, two is political action, and three is then global transformation. That's kind of euphemistically what we've called it. And all of that would, would be in coordination with our partners around the world, the other organizations working on this as well. So, uh, so that's kind of what we're setting out to do. We're, we're focusing on the public education component uh, right now, because that's where we are. But my question to you, kind of going back to what you know, Adler said and, and the discussion you just had, um, is in terms of engaging the you know, political class, if you want to call it that, um, do you have any thoughts about, I mean, does that happen by accident? Do they um, just start getting interested once they see the public get interested? Or is there a, you know, uh, ways to reach out or strategies of who to reach out to, um, et cetera, et cetera? Just wonder what your thoughts are um, on making incursions into politics. It's a big one. Uh, that's one of those questions I, uh, I'll probably answer next month. <laughs> okay. um, well, um, what I find historically <clears throat> is that um, uh, there de develops such a crisis that new people rise up ready to um, confront it. Um, in, in the, in the uh, 30s and 40s, this is, there were people like FDR and uh, Winston Churchill um, and even um, uh, and some of those are like uh, Ch Charles de Gaulle and, and after France was conquered and um, uh, and um, the crisis is so great that the convent the 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 the, the, <clears throat> the former leaders like the isolationists in the, in the United States get ignored and they get by, uh, uh, and they get uh, left behind. Uh, so, um, 
I mean, there's a, uh, I'm, I'm, I continue to believe that there are many very experienced and thoughtful people in this country who um, are ready to exercise daring leadership. Um, but the circumstances of the political circumstances now are so destructive of any newcomer that they're afraid. They don't want their reputations to be ruined as they're trying so courageously and selflessly to come to grips with these problems. And everybody's lying low. Um, it's not that we lack uh, wisdom and talent. I believe it is out there. I, I, however, it seems I'm constantly proven wrong, but it's really not the fault of individuals. It's, it's the fault of these, these uh, circumstances that have developed in our country that make politics so deadly. The, um, the division of the Senate, the, the, the representation of the rural areas in the, in the Senate. The, um, in fact, um, well, I mentioned a couple of uh, authors who talked about re uh, uh, reformation of the United States political system. And one of them is Thomas K. Finletter. I recently got his book of 1945. And the other was the uh, Rexford Guy Tug Tugwell uh, in 1970. I have their books in the back behind me. Um, I think what's going to happen is that uh, our democracy is uh, going to become so paralyzed that um, something like a fascism under Adolf Hitler is going to come here. Uh, I, I think that the founding fathers uh, design of our government with, with, with its checks and balances and its, the uh, definition of the Senate this is going to become so unworkable that um, we'll have an experiment with with a single uh, great uh, with a tyrannical leadership and uh, something like uh, the upheaval of the American Revolution will come will recur here. Uh, it could be by historical patterns that this will be the end of America as a democracy. Or it could be that really there are resources latent in the American people and in their, their memories of, of uh, our democratic uh, uh, principles that um, will have a new birth of freedom. I, um, I long for that. I'm a, I read uh, literature from the American Revolution. I just was reading Ben Franklin's uh, autobiography, uh, and Ken Burns has a beautiful um, three-part uh, series on uh, Franklin. You know that man. Well, in his that man was was drawn from the people, Bob. He wasn't Harvard educated. Mm. His wealth was all made by by his own toil. There are lots of people like that today. Um, but uh, there came this um, this crisis with Britain's uh, governance of the colonies, and and uh, Franklin uh, determined against his own son William. You know, you know that story. His son was appointed governor of New Jersey, and he was a Tory. Uh, well, Franklin had a, he took a risk. He's like, he did what Adler said he should do. He risked everything. So did George Washington. We'll either hang together or hang separately. They knew they were tight. They were, they were, uh, 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 traitors to this, to the British order. I, um, so the political class, Bob, well, 
there's a current political class, you know, that's this group, they're the ones who are educated in the best schools, Harvard and Georgetown and, and uh, uh, Baltimore. Uh, and, uh, and they, they're the ones that get, whose uh, graduates rise to positions like Anthony, um, the Secretary of State, um, and the, and the National Security. Lincoln. You know, those people, those people have been educated in the, by teachers who grew up in the Cold War and they don't, the only thing they understand is, is military solutions. And, um, and of course we have to be tough with the Russians. Um, in fact, um, a lot of the blame for what's happening in Ukraine has to be laid at the doors of American policymakers. I, I, I think that you know, what's going to happen, we're already at war with Russia. And things like Finland joining NATO, you, you think that's a, something to be proud of? Are you, you find that encouraging? Finland has an 800 mile border with, with Russia. And you, do the Finns actually think that if Russia ever should cross that border, the United States, as well as its European allies, with um, a thousand, a, a six, seven thousand mile supply line, is going to come to their aid? Are we going to have a general war worse than Vietnam over Finland? But not, it actually won't. I don't. I haven't expected Finland, but I did expect the Lat Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. We we are actually conducting military exercises in accordance with NATO planning in those three Baltic states. What's going to happen, Bob, is that we're going to go to war. And in the process, the government of the United States will become a, a tyranny, a military state. It's already pretty much a military state. And just like Hitler with the Weimar Constitu Constitution, we won't we won't openly repudiate the founding fathers constitution, but it won't work. Um, somehow we have to find the, we have to find these people who are potential who, who might guide this country through the coming crisis. I, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I, I can't foresee as clearly. I can write history. You know, um, Kierkegaard once said, um, the only way to understand things is backwards, like a historian, but life must be lived forwards. And you're the one that quotes uh, that journalist, we do things not because we, we think they'll be effective, but because they're right. Do justice even though the heavens fall. Uh, I'm a, I'm, I, what I think is happening, I can't uh, say exactly because uh, we're practically waiting on events, uh, but uh, I don't, if Putin is satisfied with taking the Donbass, that doesn't mean we're out, we're in the clear. He's going to, he's going to take the next 10 years to rebuild his Russian army. You can be sure of that. And we'll just wait for the opportunity to engage it in combat. Nancy Pelosi travels to Ukraine and she declares a victory. The goal is victory. And uh, the Secretary of Defense says our goal is to reduce Russian power for the foreseeable future. And we boast about helping the Ukrainians sink the Moskva and killing some 12 
Russian generals? Um, what's happened is all the gains in the last 75 years to unite humanity and link nations together by economic globalization, that has been undone. We have a permanent, we actually have a war already engaged uh, with Russia. United States and Russia are going to fight it out. And uh, um, So, I mean, everything I've dreamed of in my whole life, including writing this book, has been thrown into the ash heap. I, I wrote this book thinking it would provide a vision. It would remind people that greater things are actually possible. It was kind of close at one point in the 40s. Those, those uh, state resolutions in 1948, this Wallace campaign in 1948. In Congress, there was a bill which became the NATO. It hadn't passed yet. All those people like John F. Kennedy and Gerald Ford I've named, you know, they tried to avoid this. And leadership failed them. That's, that's one of my conclusions. It's true that the, there wasn't enough world community to build a world government just to, in that year. But if there had been leadership, Bob, if there had been na enlightened national leadership like that of, of Franklin Roosevelt, if, if he had lived beyond 63, yes? Or like Henry Wallace, or there were other people, Grenville Clark, who had a lot of experience in the War Department, enlightened leadership there had to be more of it we had to undo those the wartime leadership like Avril Harriman and and uh, and the secretary of the navy and and so on uh, who had uh, taken over american policy they're still they're still ruling this little this little class of elite administrators educated in the best schools, they don't send their sons to battle anymore. There are people in the, you know, the Biden administration, I'm telling you, and forgive me, I, I would like to venture a prediction. I think the Biden administration is being undone. He couldn't pass a blue collar blueprint to rebuild America, but he can find $39 billion to buy lethal weapons to send to Ukraine. Is he, is he, does he think that he can go into the midterm elections with a war on and the American people are gonna rally around the flag and actually give him a break this November? Is that what he's trying to do? I think he's gotten distracted by a foreign adventure. So let, let me just say, Joseph, I, I see there are two hands, both Chad and Ron Glossop. Um, oh, three, um, oh, four. Okay, so put your cyber hands up so I can see you. And we um, are coming down the home stretch time-wise. So Joseph, are, are you okay if I go to the next question? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll ask everybody in the queue because there are a few to uh, be as brief as possible. And I see Ted next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, Professor Barada. So happy uh, once again to be the uh, recipient of your erudition about the past and insight about <laughs> the present. Joseph, I have a rather specific and uh, possibly banal question, but um, 
I, I, the, there is an author uh, named John Nichols. Um, I know him a little bit. I admire him greatly. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's been one of the chief political writers at The Nation magazine for many years. And he, apparently he wrote a book about Wallace in the last year or two. Uh, I have not read it, but I wonder if you have, and uh, if so, um, whether he talks much about Wallace's uh, engagement with the world government idea as opposed to just Wallace as a uh, as a socialist. And before I let go of the topic, I have a hunch, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> but I have a hunch that Nichols probably largely ignores or glosses over uh, or does, doesn't pay much attention to the world government aspect of Henry Wallace. And that is something, Professor Barada, it's, it's kind of a larger question too. It's something that happens over and over again, that people who really were very serious world government aficionados, when they are talked about in the mainstream many years later, uh, it's almost completely ignored. I'll give you three quick examples. One is Einstein, when he was named Time Magazine's person of the century in 1999 by Time Magazine and their 20 page essay and Einstein barely mentioned world government at all. Two is Walter Cronkite when he died, his obituaries barely mentioned world government at all. And three, Harris Wofford, with whom you know I had a very close personal relationship. His mainstream obituaries in the New York Times and Washington Post hardly mentioned the student federalists. So it's a specific question about Wallace and a larger question too. Why do you think that is that uh, this world government heritage of major figures is so often ignored? Thank you very much. Tried to make that short, Bob, and I failed. Ted, I have four more people in ten minutes. Please let let's let get let's get Joseph in. Um, well, thank you, Ted. Uh, no, I've not heard of Don John Nichols' book about Wallace, but um, another book uh, which talks about Wallace is uh, Oliver Stone's book the untold history of the united states um very full about wallace um and uh, now the um uh so the wallace uh, uh, uh draws attention as time goes on because he offered a fundamental alternative to truman uh in the cold war um now, as far as uh, obituaries, as of Harris Wofford or um, Alan Cranston or who, even Albert Einstein, why um, they don't mention their advocacy of world government, I think, because historically this movement was a failure. Uh, and um, it's not that it's forgotten. Uh, I've been surprised to discover that people remember this, especially older people, uh, but um, it was being ahead of its time. It was um, a complete failure. And so it doesn't offer light, uh, most uh, political people think, on our problems to today. Um, in Europe, I must say, uh, there has been a little movement. Uh, I noticed that the Italian president, uh, Italian um, Prime Minister Mario Draghi, um, suggested that the European Union should develop majority rule institutions in place of its unanimity rule, which is a way to say that Europe should complete its, its federalization. So in Europe, actually, this is alive. I mean, that's why I work with Lucio Levi uh, at the um, at the journal uh, the Federalist Debate. It's dead in America. It's embarrassing. The um, there are books about Einstein which are much fairer. There's a, there'll be a whole chapter. I can give you a list of books on Einstein, but um, there'll be a whole chapter. I wrote one myself. Um, but uh, it's a curiosity. Einstein was so naive, you know, it's irrelevant. Okay, let's do an, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I, I have Ron, Barat, Virginia, and Gail in the queue. 
Uh, so Ron, take it away. I would just like to point out that there's a conflict within the United States and other places like Soviet Union between the political view and the economics. The political democracy is a leftist ideology. Capitalism is a rightist ideology. And we have that conflict within our own system. And it also exists elsewhere. When the Republicans take over, what happens when we, under Reagan, we make the Soviet Union capitalistic. Gorbachev is trying to make it democratic, but it just doesn't work with the Republicans. They view it as a victory for capitalism over communism. That's how they viewed the end of the Cold War and set up capitalism in the Soviet Union. Well, I, I really don't see why, why there's so much hatred for Russia. Um, now, of course, everything has changed, but until the February 24th of 2022, um, I saw no reason to really fear or hate Russia, it, it, the Communist Party dissolved peacefully. And um, a multi-party democracy, technically at least, uh, there are four major parties in Russia, uh, was established. And um, the socialist planning was abandoned with the Communist Party. And so uh, free market capitalism was actually introduced into Russia. What more would the Republicans or goodness, the, the Russia, I call them the Russophobes. What more do the Russophobes want? Instead, what they've done is ruin all the progress that had been made. Uh, George Kennan, uh, in uh, quotations that you hear from uh, Thomas Friedman uh, and, and, uh, uh, and others, there's a a wonderful um, website. I just uh, I'd have to, I'd have to find it, but uh, in which the antecedents to the Ukraine invasion are all laid out masterfully by an Indian commentator. Um, Ron, we are in the grip of insanity. Let's. Um, Let's uh, get another question out because okay, I have Bharat, then Virginia, then Gail. Yeah, I have a, uh, <laughs> a sort of a question. Uh, I hear you say that perhaps the only way we could have a change is if some new person uh, uh, emerges uh, if we want to wish for a change. I thought in the last election, Donald Trump was one of those new people that all of a sudden came up. Uh, and I'm sure you're not uh, uh, that happy that something like that happened and it, it continues the impact to, to the Republican party in the state of our country. Uh, so that, that's one thought. The other thought, which is, uh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your perspective, historical outlook, and your sense of sadness and uh, that you feel about the way uh, we here are moving in the world, you know, with our cu current political shenanigans. And I, I wonder how much you think money this uh, Supreme Court ruling about uh, money is uh, uh, free speech and corporations are a person uh, could be attributed to the problems we are facing in our democracy. And the third part that I have a question about is uh, with all the warts and, and you know, uh, very correct uh, assessment you made of, of the problems that we cause in the world. I hear very little about 
what you think of what people like Putin are doing. In other words, what their policies and the way they are acting in the way they're responding by just having uh, ruthless killing in Ukraine that we see every day on television. Uh, is that something that we can uh, just sit by and look at? And uh, um, shouldn't we be responding in, in, in ways that, uh, uh, you know, we restore some humanity? Anyway, that's, uh, that's all I have to ask. Thank you. It, it, it's more like, uh, I, I feel kind of lost in how we can move forward. So I, I'm seeking your uh, advice. <laughs> um, well, um, let's just deal with Putin for a minute. Um, you know, Putin, uh, uh, last July, uh, produced a very thoughtful historical essay on the uh, identity between the Ukrainian and Russian peoples. They um, had been united. Um, the, the Kievan Rus was the first uh, Russian state, and the, uh, the peoples of uh, Ukraine uh, joined the Russian uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Church um, very early in the 16th century. Uh, the uh, language was only recently uh, produced a, a dialect known as Ukrainian, uh, and yet uh, Putin invaded. Um, and I found I, I thought it I thought that strange that he would. This was not a foreign country that he invaded. This was a part of Russia, a historic part of Russia. Uh, uh, and um, what he did was really launch a civil war in Ukraine. He waged war upon what he regards as a kindred people. It's just like the Union waging war against the South in the 1860s. Um, um, it is so absurd. I mean, it, what he's doing, if you Ukrainians were not a distinct people before he invaded, he is doing the very thing that will unite them as a separate people. And you can see it the way they hang on to their language. Kiev is the old Kiev, uh, and Kharkiv is the old Kharkov, you know, and uh, and uh, there's nothing there's nothing like uh, trying to kill your people than kill kill a people than to, to unite those people in hatred for the invader. So Barat, this doesn't make sense. Yes. Um, but what else could he do since the West treated Russia with such contempt and spread NATO closer and closer to its borders? I've been thinking, you know, for, I'm a historian and do you remember that it used to be said of Adolf Hitler that uh, he was right that the Versailles Treaty was very unjust and unfair to the Germans. He proclaimed uh, a new Reich to, to repudiate the Versailles Treaty. Well, in retrospect, he had something to, it was, there was some sense in that. That, that treaty was the work of France and Britain, and it was vindictive toward Germany. Germany was not the cause of World War I. All the powers of the Europe share the blame for that war, and yet Germany was made to pay the price. So, but does that mean that because the, histor the history justified the rise of Hitler, does that mean he was right in launching a war of aggression against France and eventually the Soviet Union. We're faced with the same problem. The historical origin of the war in Ukraine is, is laid at the, at the foot of the United States and its allies in Europe, no doubt. But we can't. So what happens? We forget the history. And because he's creating atrocities in Ukraine, 
we are we are determined to fight him and we're going to we're, we're going to seek victory as Nancy Pelosi said and we'll have our little or have our another round of American triumphalism you know what we're doing we're we're defeating the project of Peter the Great we're going to push we're going to push Russia back into Asia get her out of Europe expand NATO into Ukraine and Belarus, as well as Finland, Sweden, and the Baltic states, and get Georgia in there too. And um, next is um, Serbia. Just push Russia out, force her into isolation deep within Asia. And that project of Peter the Great to open a window of onto Europe. That's the way we're going to solve this problem. No matter what the historical justifications are, the movement is to destroy and marginalize the Russians, Russian power. Um, as for the tyrant who may emerge, uh, it, it could be Trump. I, I would be, but uh, Trump is not just to blame for all this opposition to American democracy. If there's not Trump, it's gonna be somebody else that we don't suspect. I'm always kind of interesting. There's this, I'm always, uh, I can, can't predict things. Uh, I've heard that there's a, the governor of Florida, DeSantis is, is not, is not in Trump's pocket? I don't really know. I can't, <laughs> I, I'm not, but somebody, somebody worse than Trump is surely gonna come about, come, come up. As far as corporations, as persons, uh, Bharat, you, you're a physicist. You should read a little economics. Uh, the, the, the um, the notion that corporations are persons goes back further than the um, what was it Southern Pacific Railroad versus Arizona or something 1884 eight, that, that decision of the Supreme Court was yeah, not I think it was Florida. Santa Clara I think it was California Clara County what. I think it was Santa Clara versus the Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific versus Santa Clara County of California. Um, 1884, was it? Somewhere in there. Um, the, 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 the Supreme Court of the United States recognized corporations as persons going all the way back to Dartmouth College in 1819, I think. Um, this is a lot. I actually did some serious reading about this because um, in, a, in, a, in books of American documents that I have uh, called the Annals of America. And um, because um, a group in Massachusetts had proposed a constitutional amendment to uh, deny the view that corporations are persons and uh, who enjoy uh, the rights of Americans. Um, and I'm not sure that's a wise thing to do. Uh, corporations exist uh, to provide benefits that single persons cannot do. And that we've had them since the building of bridges, Charles River Bridge uh, in Boston and so on. Um, it's not that simple as de denying that corporations are persons. What we have to do is tax them reasonably if that can be done. Uh, I fear that Virginia Swain is going to ask it one of those impossible questions. Um, unless she's got the text of the Quaker testimony, I'd rather hear from somebody else. Yeah. Well, Joseph, before I bring in uh, Virginia and Gail, I just want to check with you. As they say in sports, we are now in overtime. Uh, so I just want to point that out and, and ask you, Joseph, um, if you have another, I would say, 15 minutes or so um, to continue on with the re remaining questions. <laughs> well, I'm flattered that I still have a little audience left. Okay. Much reduced from the old days, but um, 
if anybody wants to can stay a little longer, I'd be delighted to. Okay, great. Well, uh, hearing yes. Um, so are, are, I was going to call on Virginia next. So are, are you saying you want to pass on responding <laughs> to that question? Do you have the text of the Quaker testimony? Peace text? Well, read it out to us, please. Oh, great. Thank you, Virginia. That's not what I was going to say. <laughs> I just uh, let me just say one one thing quickly, Simon. I've been trying to reach you. Could you put your email in the chat box? Um, I, I'm I have a question about things you've said all along. Um, so here's the testimony. Um, the Quaker faith testimony: We utterly deny all outward deny all outward wars and strife, and fightings with outward weapons for any end or under any pretense whatsoever. That this is our testimony to the whole world. The spirit of Christ by which we are guided is not changeable. So as once to command us from a thing as evil and again to move into it. And we do certainly know and, and so testify to the world that the spirit of Christ, which leads us into all truth will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for the kingdom of this world. Declaration of Quakers to Charles II, 1660. So just a, a quick postscript um, to some of the things you were saying. I totally agree with you about my frustration about um, the uh, preoccupation of Ukraine, not that we shouldn't be responding. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I've been trying to get the attention of, of um, Congress on such a support a bipartisan bill to build civic bridges in this country. And they they are not interested in this country anymore. They've lost interest. They, they uh, are preoccupied with this war. My own congressman just went to, um, went to um, Ukraine with Pelosi last weekend. And they quickly approved this bill without any debate, this $40 million. So it's a, it's, it, I'm torn because I don't want to, I don't want to see um, um, the same thing happen as with Hitler. But I share that frustration that you have. But I'm also concerned about world community, which there doesn't seem to be right now. And you've always said, without world community, world government would never happen. Could you speak to that? Well, I, I think the, the degree of world community that had been slowly forming since the end of the Second World War, and especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union, this uh, is is uh, even more reduced. Um, I actually had been hopeful about globalization. Uh, I knew that the World Federalist Movement had failed, uh, but um, I thought that economic uh, globalization, um, the way it was developing under American leadership, business leadership, why it was, it, it is making, helping to unite people economically, and that's that's being crushed. Uh, Gail. What's your question? Oh, well, um, I was surprised to hear, to read that William Fulbright, Senator William Fulbright, um, according to, I don't know where it was in the reading, but um, he called for a constitutional amendment to try to force Truman to resign and to hold um, a presidential election in 1946. I'm wondering why that was. Pardon me, but could you have a, a page reference there? Gail, you went on mute somehow. Yeah, I do, page 
Something about J. William Fulbright? Mm hmm Well, uh, there's no mention of Senator Fulbright, but um, but uh, it, but um, uh, but I did comment that um, about the Seventeenth Amendment, which provided for the direct election of senators. It's a very historic uh, 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 amendment uh, because uh, formerly the, the senators had been appointed by the state legislatures. And what happened in the 17th Amendment was they were made directly elected by the people, mm. which meant that the Senate became not an organ of the states, but uh, a legislature representative of people. The same thing happened in Europe when the European Parliament was made directly elected by the people in 1979. But I regard those. Um, so what the point in this paragraph on page 453 is that um, um, uh, 28 of the 32 states demanded uh, a, co a constitutional convention to, pro to amend the constitution to provide for the direct election of senators, you see? And although it failed, it's another typical failure that which is deceptive because uh, it led to success. Um, uh, then um, when the states uh, failed to reach the requisite number of uh, recommendations, why uh, Congress had to act uh, in accordance with the other part of the of Article 5. And um, that's what, I mean, the, the point was that this, um, uh, this struggle for World Federation in the states could have moved Congress to act on some of those World Federalist bills by the precedent of the politics of the 17th Amendment. I hope you, uh, I'm, I've been kind of, uh, I've been kind of uh, despairing before this group, but um, I hope you realize that the history of the World Federalist Movement was a was not a, a complete failure. It was not something that was just um, left behind no heritage, uh, or um, um, so uh, uh, it, the way it's remembered as if by historians and by the general public is just not worth bothering about because it was a failure. This overlooks the how close it was. Can you imagine getting 16 bills introduced introduced in Congress today on World Federation? And and I mean Bob, you you have your three part strategic plan, but but um, If you ever get to stage three, you're going to be faced with the same thing. You know, you're going to have to, unless you're foolish and think that the people can do this without the states helping, um, you're going to reach a point where um, you're going to have to carry these resolutions in Congress to completion. They can't just be rescinded and forgotten about. Great. So Joseph, I'm going to need to, rather than see if there are further questions, I'm going to need to wrap it up because this time I have an appointment that I have to get to. And I want to give people a chance to make announcements if they have any. And we have some announcements about the next book that we need to make. Um, so um, 
so with that, um, so Joseph, any kind of last words you want to say on the session, and then we'll move to announcements. Well, I chose these two chapters because I thought they would exhibit vividly the kind of politics that you will ultimately have to deal with. Um, I really, uh, I'm looking forward to new leadership, Bob Flax. Um, I'm not very optimistic, but I would like to see some new leadership emerge. Well, hallelujah on that for sure. Great. Okay. So, um, so Joseph, once again, thank you. Um, we have not had a session yet that people have not hung on every word and stayed later. Um, so uh, uh, thank you again for another very rich session. Uh, before um, Gail and I talk about the next book, and Dre, I see you there. If you're present, you could uh, add into that. Uh, but are there any announcements from anyone else here um, about any events or book releases or anything that folks wanted to let the group know? Going once, going twice. Okay, hearing none. Um, uh, either um, Gail or Drea, uh, are, are you um, prepared or, in, you know, do you want to speak about where we are with negotiating with Tiziana and the time and all that stuff? We did a survey and, and all that. And so we still have some people, um, if you haven't, uh, filled out the survey. I actually can just send it here in the in the chat, if that's okay, Bob. Sure. So don't respond again. Respond if you um, if you do. And and Dre, can you let people know what the survey is asking for those who haven't responded? Dre, you're on mute at the moment. Sorry. Uh, so Gail sent out a survey um, this past week, uh, just asking people for their availability. So the next author for Union Now, uh, she can come for three out of the five sessions, but the uh, time has to be changed to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we just wanted to get everyone's input on your availability if that is changed. So the survey now is in the chat box. So if you could please fill it out if you haven't filled it out yet. Right, and so far those who have filled it out all said that they are able to do the later time. So Tiziana can come for three of the five sessions. So those three will be at the later time and then we'll go back to our regular time. So you could have your Saturday to go out and do whatever you do on Saturdays but the first three sessions would need to be later. Okay. So uh, either Gail or Drea, anything else on that? Or any questions about that? Okay, so seeing none, um, I will um, call this session adjourned. Oh, I was gonna, oh, yes. I was gonna just remind people that the next session will be on the second Saturday of the month as usual, which is June 11 at the same time and place, uh, namely Zoom is the place and the time is noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And we will wrap up this book with the conclusion to both volumes global, of go, global governance pages 527 to 538 and also appendix F pages 539 to 556 World Federalist Declarations, and I'll send you, you know, I'll send you the info as well by email. Great. And I realized I do have one announcement. David Orton, who is here for the first half of the session, uh, couldn't be here for the second, so he asked me uh, to make the following announcement, that on Sunday, May 22nd, that's Sunday, May 22nd, at three o'clock central time, uh, Donna Park, our board chair, will be speaking at the St. Louis annual meeting via Zoom. Uh, anybody's invited to attend. 
Um, it will be focused on her inspiration for joining the movement and her involvement. Um, if folks want to, um, I believe David may have already sent out an announcement about that, but if folks are interested um, to contact him at Orton, that's O-U-G-H-T-O-N, Orton at hotmail.com. That's Orton at hotmail.com and he could send you the link. So with that, I will now say session adjourned. Uh, have a fabulous month, everyone. You can come back next month for the thrilling conclusion. Um, and uh, Gail, if you would stay on for a minute and Joseph, we can talk about the conference as well. Okay. Take care, everybody. Have a great month. Thank you so much. Okay. So, wow, another, uh, another session with a lot of food for thought that you gave us, Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you wanna say first? Um, well, now let's go back to um, the unfinished business about your November conference. Yes, yes. So, uh um, so uh, uh, Gail, um, Joseph, I'm I've been speaking to Joseph about being a speaker at the conference so uh, in November. So I was gonna talk to him a bit about that. Um, is there anything that we need to do with the book club or else I could let you go if you wanna get onto your Saturday? Yeah, I can't think of anything. Okay, so I'll let you go and Joseph and I will just um, chat for a couple of minutes. Alrighty, thanks. Okay, take Bye. care. Have a good one. Okay, so so first of all, my apologies. You know, when when you, as I said in the email, when you when you said you'd rather speak on the European Union, I just without thinking just said sure, um, not remembering that Drea and I a couple of weeks earlier met with Shariar about a bunch of other things and had thought that it would be great for someone living in the EU. Uh, to uh, yeah. report on the EU and has been, you know, who's been involved with it. Yeah. So we asked yeah. Shariar if he could recommend anyone and I totally forgot and he said he would look and I sent you the bio of the person that, uh, that he came up with. I don't even know if that person's available or not, but, um, but my, my bad uh, that I forgot that and, you know, it kind of reflexively said, sure, you know, we'd be happy to have you do the EU. Uh, yeah, I've uh, had a little contact with uh, Pappy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if I'm, I think it's better to have somebody much closer to the scene in Europe mm. do that. Uh, which means that um, since Byron Belitsov is is uh, willing to talk about the Chicago committee, mm -hmm. why? Um, I suppose I might talk about Grenville Clark and his uh, book, World Peace Through World Law. So you, I could occupy that slot. Well, if, if that's okay with you, um, you know, I, I would be thrilled. I mean, I really appreciate that. That would flesh out our speakers. Um, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, uh, unlike um, the last year's conference on the paths to World Federation, where there are people you know, actively working on different strategies and stuff. As you know, those earlier proposals, you know, there are no advocates for them. They're, they're kind of just, you know, part of history. So uh, I realized in the process of getting speakers for that, it wouldn't be the same as for the, the paths to a World Federation. So I, I do really appreciate that. Uh, uh, just to... Uh... Briefly, uh, Bob, uh, what do you expect uh, these speakers to do? Um, make a little speech for fifteen minutes, or yeah. What? Well, well, what 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 we um, did last year, and we probably and the model worked very well. Is the entire chunk of time was fifty minutes, five zero, and the speaker could take as much of that time as they wanted to—a half hour, twenty minutes, whatever. Uh, presenting the model, 
I will send an outline out of some points so that, um, you know, so, so all of the speakers, you know, it's not, you know, so that the audience doesn't have to compare apples with oranges, you know, so that every speaker mentions, you know, who are the people involved? What was the origin of the idea? Um, you know, how did it come about? And then a little bit on um, the branches of the proposed government. What does the legislature look like? What does the executive look like? Uh, you know, et cetera, the, the, the judiciary. Um, what enforcement system, you know, did they propose? So I'll, I'll put out a template. Um, so then again, the audience uh, hears these things, you know, can compare apples with apples, as I said. Um, and, then, um, and then whenever you're done, you know, we'll just open it for Q&A. Um, the other thing we did last year, which seemed to work really well, is at the end of the session, um, those that, um, I mean, we, we had um, uh, breakout rooms. So if someone wanted to talk about this model more or that model more, they could. And we invited the uh, presenters to be in those rooms to answer for the questions. In some cases, they could. In some cases, you know, we had presenters from Australia and Europe and, you know, all around. So in some cases, it was just too late for them. Uh, so they uh, did not stay for that. And we had a staff person uh, moderate the discussion. Um, so that's um, so that's how we did it. It seemed to work very well. We got really, uh, you know, very, very positive feedback. So we were going to replicate uh, that form. Okay. Right. And I sent you the, uh, the times that are available. Um, so I'll wait till I hear from you. And then I'll give the, you know, since we already talked you know, got to that level. And then I'll speak to the other people about the remaining times after we've taken, you know, the one you took off the schedule or off the availability is not off the schedule. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and I, I, I want to say, you know, the, um, you know, I, I mean, just how much I've appreciated, um, you know, not only, I mean, I've said this before, I think, but I just feel compelled that, you know, not only in sharing your wisdom and knowledge, but really your heart and soul. And, and, and it's just, um, you know, I, I, I think people, you know, I know, I, well, let me just speak for myself. I, I think that I have definitely uh, got a much deeper sense of, of the kind of the tragic sense of how the arc of this movement has unfolded, what we're left with today, uh, the task before us, if we do want to move this forward, uh, the obvious difficulties, uh, you know, the way those difficulties have been greatly expanded or increased by what's happening in Europe right now, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it just gives me a much deeper, um, you know, full, full-bodied appreciation for the whole of it. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to thank you uh, for, for that. I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll try to leave on a positive note in the sixth, <laughs> in the sixth meeting uh, on the conclusions. Okay. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So thank and you. Yeah, and let me just say, I, I do hope that, um, you know, that at other times uh, we can consult with you for your perspective on things. I mean, I just find... The, the you know the, the the historical context that you bring invaluable, um, and I I do hope that you know I could reach out to you. Um, oh, let me mention I I I I'm glad I remembered this one other thing which you might not yet know about um, that um, you know when you mentioned about us getting in the public eye and all that um, one thing that we are doing going back to Putin is given the uh, <clears throat> you know given that the uh, you know, Biden and uh, what is it, Lindsey Graham um, had, you know, unanimous uh, approval of his resolution to support the ICC and in investigating Putin and the generals and all that stuff, that we saw this really as an opportunity to point out the hypocrisy 
and that, um, uh, wait a second, we haven't ratified the Rome statutes, you know? So, um, so we're actually um, mounting a campaign to have the US sign on to the ICC. Um, we are kicking that campaign off with a press conference, probably the end of June. Uh, it might be at the um, press club uh, in Washington. Uh, Bill Pace is coming in for that. He's our keynote speaker. Um, and, um, uh, oh, geez, uh, Leila Sadat, um, who is on our advisory council, uh, but, and no, no uh, relation to Anwar Sadat, if you know her. Um, she is a, an advisor um, to uh, Khan. Uh, the prosecutor of, of the uh, ICC. So, um, so she is also, uh, both Bill and Layla are going to be our two keynote speakers. Uh, Byron is, uh, since he lives locally there, he's the project manager. He's getting that set up. And, um, and we're also reconnecting uh, <clears throat> uh, th through Bill with the Washington Working Group um, that's had, uh, that, you know, got the, uh, that was working on the ratification uh, 20 years ago. Um, and the, uh, and they also came to the same conclusion that this is a time to, uh, to really jump on this, you know, a, a window of opportunity to bring the, uh, the court to the attention of the Senate and, and hopefully get it ratified. And also in the process to rescind, um, the, uh, you know, the laws or resolutions, whatever, that both Bush and Trump uh, put uh, against the court. Uh, so that, um, you know, uh, technically that may need to happen first. I mean, it probably will, um, you know, uh, and then we can get on to the, um, uh, you know, to signing on to the Rome statutes. So I wanted to let you know uh, uh, that that's in the offing and, um, and that will put us, um, you know, if we're successful and the press is there and all that, uh, that will put us right in the spotlight once again. So just to let you know. Well, um, you mentioned hypocrisy. Um, you, there has been a, a very um, moving article of, by Fintan O'Toole in the current issue of the New York Review of Books. I read it. <laughs> Have you read it? Yeah. Well, well, I read a part. I, I read a portion of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it might be good to read the whole thing. Um, yeah. Because, uh, well, what could happen is that the United States should try to prosecute Putin with the ICC, but not submit to um, its jurisdiction ourselves. Right. And so they'll turn it, they're going to turn the ICC into it a weapon of this uh, war against Russia. Yeah. And, uh, I tell you that there are people who know how to pervert everything. And yeah. uh, you get the smartest people you can on your side because the, there's going to be little, little actions maybe in the Senate uh, that will just completely reverse this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, that, that, I mean, there's no question about that. Um, you know, ho hopefully the, um, this Washington Working Group, which has about 25 or more organizations, including the American Bar Association, Amnesty International, et cetera, et cetera, uh, hopefully they will have resources that we don't have at this point uh, to be able to do that. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. I'll see you next month. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye now.